Hello, this is Dr. Pat Sharp. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, and this is the sixth in a series of short videos that I'm offering about helping you with your grief process after you've lost someone you loved. If you are in the midst of this journey, you know how difficult it can be. Today's purpose is just to help you understand the stages of grief and to help identify where you are along that journey. Stage one is denial and shock. And that can happen whether your loved one had a sudden unexpected death, like a heart attack, which was the case of my second husband, or something more a long ongoing cancer death that was long and lingering and um, it can still hit you when they actually die. I definitely experienced this first stage in both of my losses both when it was a sudden unexpected one and when it was a long drawn out expected one. The main thing that kind of strikes me looking back on that and what I can read and learn from the training I've had in grief work is that nothing seems real. You don't seem real. The world around you doesn't seem real. How can people be walking around out there laughing? How can people be going out to dinner? And the very fact that they're gone that first awakening after your first sleep, after their loss, and that sudden thunderbolt of awareness that hits you with, oh my gosh, they're not here anymore, doesn't seem real. And you don't feel like you. You just absolutely don't feel normal. C.S. Lewis, who is one of my very favorite authors, you may know him more associated with the Tales of Narnia children's series, but he's written many outstandingly wonderful books, one of them, dealing with grief is a grief observed where he talks about his experiences after the loss of his beloved wife joy and he talks about walking around feeling slightly concussed as if he had a concussion and I can attest to that that is exactly how I felt for many 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 weeks after the deaths of both of my husbands um, you can literally feel like you're going crazy because you'll find yourself doing things you know are not real like, I remember after my first husband passed, thinking that if I could just turn my head fast enough from the kitchen sink, I could catch him sitting in his chair over in the den that was visible from the sink. And I really, truly believed if I could do that fast enough, I'd catch him. I would see him. And that's crazy thinking. But you are in shock and you are in denial and that's part of all of that. It's completely normal. Do not feel like you're going crazy. You're not. It will pass. Stage two, I only experienced with my first husband. I didn't get this with my second husband. And I'll tell you in a few minutes why that happened. But the point is that when you do feel the anger, you're going to be a very difficult person to help because you are perpetually cranky and sad and miserable and you don't want to be helped and you don't want people to help you and you just want people to get away from you. And I'm going to share, if I may, one episode on a street corner in town. I was walking from my office to a women's conference um, and the light was red and there was a group of women who were also going to the conference and they were gathering waiting for the light as I was and I was kind of in the front of this small herd of women and a gal that I knew, a colleague who I hadn't seen for a while, approached me and said, Oh, Pat, how are you? How are you doing? And how's Bob? How's your husband doing? Because she knew he'd been ill and, and fighting cancer. And I, just in a flat-out rage that is so completely unlike my nature, yelled at the top of my lungs at her that he's dead. And then I was shocked at what I had done. I was so embarrassed. I turned and peeking through my fingers that were covering my face, I could see the blood drain from 40 faces in front of me as they tried to deal with, oh my gosh, you know, what? what's with this woman? Um, I just felt wretched, just absolutely horrible. But that's part of anger, and it's normal. Don't beat yourself up about it. Um, but you'll find yourself mostly yelling at God. For me, it was God, or whatever greater being you um, have in your life. Um, and sometimes it can even bubble over into how you treat your children, how you treat your friends. Um, some people only find that they rail against God, and I certainly did that after the loss of my first husband. I was so furious with God for not saving Bob that I very decidedly threw God out of my life. 
he was worthless to me. He was, he didn't do what I asked. I had been good. I had prayed. I had done all the right things. I'd gone to church, and he was just a big meanie. And so I was done with him. And that was probably one of the most disastrous decisions I could have made at that time. But it all came out of the anger. So even if you experience this emotion of anger, you typically, even if you don't typically experience anger, it will bubble up. Don't be surprised by it. Again, it's completely normal. Now, I just want to briefly talk about why I think I didn't get anger as a reaction, as a stage of grief with the loss of my second husband. And I think it's because by that time, I had accepted God back into my life. I had recommitted to the fact that he was a good God. He was with me. He was just as sad and upset about my second husband's death, David, as I was. Um, and he was with me. And when I'd ask him to support and help me, um, I got it. He was there. So I never really got that feeling of anger. And I was so relieved once I had God in my life. And I'm not promising you that that would happen for you. I'm just sharing my own experience. The third stage, which I definitely went through with the loss of my first husband because I didn't have God in my life, I think, was bargaining. Oh my goodness, my journal was just filled with all these bargains, all these requests that, God, if you'll just let me see him for two minutes, then I'd back down to like, okay, could I, could I just talk with him for just one minute? Um, and of course, none of these work. Um, and of course, it, it doesn't produce a solution because you're not in control of God. God's, God's the one in control. Um, and hence, you know, because you don't get what you want, then that rolls back into anger at God again. And it's just this vicious circle. And I circled around for many, many, many months after my first husband's death without God, running through cycles of bargaining and anger, bargaining and anger, and the fourth stage, depression. Because when you have all of this sadness, the shock, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, it eventually just leads to first-class depression. And even though as a trained mental health counselor, I knew all about the signs of depression, um, my depression stage, and maybe yours as well, your finding is extensive crying. You Are you just crying all the time at the drop of a hat, feeling like you want to die? Like that seems like a better solution at this point because it's too hard to go on the way you are. If you actually think of a plan, create a plan, and think you could carry it out, immediately call for help. I'm, I plead with you right now. You don't know how dangerous this spot is that you can be in and how easy it is to take your life. So call a friend, call 91, call a family member, call anyone, a neighbor, somebody who's close and can get to you. That, that's just a very, very important thing to do. Somewhere along in this depression stage, and I must have been at least a year, maybe a year, oh, it was probably a year and a half into my cycles of going through, reverberating back and forth through all these cycles of grief, that I made the decision to ah, give up. I was at the end of myself. I had done everything I thought I could do to help myself, and I just decided, okay, I'm going to see if I can find out if there really is a God or not. So I set out to prove him or disprove him because I kept reverberating with this 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 thought in my head that Bob just couldn't be gone. He couldn't just be nothing. He had to be somewhere. Where was he? And that led me to this search for God. But once I got to the edge of the precipice and I realized I couldn't scientifically prove God, I had to make what I had heard before referred to as the leap of faith, once I made that leap of faith, oh, I can't tell you how easy it was then, how supported I felt, how calm I felt. The peace that surpasses understanding just completely washed over me. So I put this slide in because it's just so, it's such a classic visual of what's going on in your brain when you're severely depressed. That would be the brain on the left. And you can see it's it's not working very well. It's almost not working at all. You're like shut down. So you can't, you feel helpless. You are hopeless because nothing's working. You can't think. Um, and you can see the not depressed brain, that's working pretty good. So finally and gradually, 
you will all get to that stage of acceptance. Oh my gosh, what a blessing that is to know that you're going to survive. Um, for me, I would say I, I went, I kind of skipped from shock and denial, a little bit of depression, but within, I would say within a good four or five month period of time, I was definitely at acceptance and I knew I was. I knew I was going to be okay. I knew God was with me. I knew he was helping me on a daily basis because I would ask and he would be there. He would send me this peace that surpassed understanding. It made no sense how I could feel so joyful. I had one girlfriend say to me, um, I don't understand, Pat. How can you be so happy when you've just lost your husband? This is maybe four months after he had died. And I said, well, actually, I'm not happy if you define happiness as getting what you want, but I am joyful. And, and I explained to her that that joy came from not, what thing, not things I got, but this feeling of connection to the bigger plan, the destiny that I too was headed for, which was this eternal heaven, this bliss, this being with David again. Um, that was joyful. That gave me joy, and it gave me hope. Um, at that feeling of acceptance, at that place, you're, you, you've gotten to the place where you are so tired of being weepy and sad all the time that you just make this decision to change. Um, after my first husband's death, the turning point for me was, it was just before my 50th birthday and my girlfriends were planning to have a big birthday bash for me. And a day or two before the party, it occurred to me that I was going to be 50. And 50 was really only probably halfway through my entire life. And I still had a lot of living to do, but I wasn't living. I was slowly dying, not living at all. So one final little caveat here is that you're going to cycle through grief, but these arrows indicate that it kind of goes in a one direction way at the top, starting with denial and then anger and then bargaining and depression. I hope I made it clear that it goes back and forth, circles around and around, many, many times. Um, so I hope this information has helped you today. I hope I can help you further if you visit my website, thethrivingdespitegrief.com. I look very forward to talking with you, perhaps, and have a blessed day.